It's always good to be back in the pulpit. I know I joke with folks about trying to get somebody else to preach for me, but too many people threatened that they were going to go home if I didn't preach today. Some folks say I get too much vacation. I don't know about that. As Brother Les read for us, I want to continue our thoughts that we started two weeks ago on the topic of sin and the evils of sin. If you recall back, if you were here those two weeks ago, you'll remember that we discussed some aspects of sin. How that sin, first of all, is a divider. How that it divides us from God. How that it divides brethren. And how that it divides families. You will also remember that sin is a destroyer. Sin is that which will destroy us from our very existence. Someone said, well, what do you mean by that? Well... <clears throat> what do we mean when we talk about sin being the destroyer? How does it destroy us in our existence? When we think about sin and certain activities which are considered sin, when we indulge in those activities, destroying us could be the consequences. When you think of one who may be an alcoholic. Brother James, I appreciate your humility this morning in Bible class of saying that. If Brother James had stayed in the state that he was and not had become a Christian, that sin of drinking could have destroyed him, not just spiritually, but think about the physical side. The consequence of what can happen to one who remains in strong drink. Cirrhosis of the liver. Perhaps it might have been one night that you were out and you were driving that two-ton weapon that we drive. And you were involved in an automobile accident. Not only could you take the life of another driver, but you could even lose your own life. Sin, brother, destroys us. But the third thing that we looked at last week was how sin debilitates passion. How sin from working within is like a termite. And how that slowly, over the course of time, things are introduced into our nation. And slowly but surely, the country that we know is destroyed. The Bible is plentiful with examples of nation after nation who were destroyed because of sin. But I want to share with you a few more things this morning about what sin is and the evils of sin. Brother, when you go to the book of Hebrews chapter 3, and you look in verse 13, the Hebrew writer there brings out a very interesting point because he says, when we need to exhort one another daily, while it is called today, notice why it's important for us to encourage, to exhort, and to uplift each other daily. It says that it is, we can be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Brother, sin is deceitful. How many times have you ever seen some specific sin? And I could pick any number, but how many times have you seen sin walk up and it has a name badge on and says, Hello, my name is. Doesn't sin do a good job of disguising itself, hiding itself from us, so that we might be deceived into doing something. Think about Satan. Think about Satan as being an artist, if you will. And when you look at sin, think about how Satan takes the paint in all the different colors and how he combines those colors into a beautiful piece of artwork. But it is all to deceive us and cause us to fall from God. You know, I was listening to the radio just the other day, and I heard a gentleman who used to live in Las Vegas. He now lives in Jackson, Tennessee. He says, when you go to Las Vegas, and when you see the city during the day, he said it is one of the ugliest places that you can dwell in. He says, but when the sun goes down and the lights come on, Brother Satan throws the lights up 
And he throws the lights up in order to draw us in the deceitfulness of sin. But not, next when we think about sin, not only does sin deceive us, but while sin is that which is a great deceiver, let us understand this morning that the pleasure that comes from sin is only temporary. When I go to the book of Hebrews and I begin reading in chapter 11, there as I begin reading in verse 24 about a gentleman named Moses who says there in the Scripture that he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy, notice what it says, the passing pleasures of sin. Brethren, sin's pleasures, sin's effects are temporary in this life. But in eternity, the pleasures of sin is eternal. Because ultimately it is the pleasure that we find in sin that keeps us separated from God, that will separate us from Him not only in life today, but when it comes the time for our judgment. I find it very interesting about Moses. How would you have liked to have lived in the days of Moses? How would you have liked to have lived in the time to see him rise from one who was doomed to death as a baby because of the decree of Pharaoh? Only to be saved by the daughter of Pharaoh but who raised him? Excuse me, that's not correct. Is it? Who reared him? The proper way to put it. Who reared Moses? It wasn't Pharaoh's daughter. I wonder if that's why he was refusing to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Because she was not involved in the day-to-day -day activities of bringing him up in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. Who was it? It was his mama. And so his mama, as she taught him from a very early age, she taught him the principles of who God was and what it meant to be faithful and obedient to God. And because of that upbringing, Moses said, I am not going to enjoy all that I have the right to. Moses could have become the most powerful leader in the land, in the world. Yet he, as one of our presidents said, chose to serve a higher power. And that was to serve God. <coughs> Brethren, sin is temporary in its nature. When one participates in some sinful activity, it is only for the moment that that pleasure exists. When one, and I, I guess I'm just going to use alcohol this morning as my major point. That's a whole subject for another day. But when one enjoys the imbibing and the, the participation in, in strong drink, you participate and you drink, and you feel good for a short period of time. What I'm going to say because I know some of you used to be heavy drinkers. But you've changed your life. And for that, God be thanked. But brethren, you wake up in the morning. And it feels like somebody is beating you on the head with a sledgehammer. Was it worth the temporary pleasure to suffer the banging of the sledgehammer on the head? I've never been hit the head with a sledgehammer, by the way. I just want you to know that. I know some of you think I would drop on my head when I was a baby, and that was bad enough. But brother, understand something. The pleasure is temporary. It's fleeting. I wonder if that's why Moses said no to that. And he chose to suffer because he knew there was something better in life. And so as I think about sin being that temporary pleasure, 
When I go and I read the writings of Paul in Galatians chapter 6, as he writes in verse 7 and verse 8, where he gives us the admonition not to be deceived, he says, remember, God is not mocked. Don't let yourself be deceived. God is not mocked. He goes on in that verse and he says, Remember, whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For if he sows to the flesh, guess what he's going to reap? He's going to reap corruption. But he who sows in the Spirit, to the Spirit, will receive, will receive, will reap everlasting life. Sold to the flesh, sold to the ways of the world, and what are you going to reap? Death. Spiritual death. But brethren, if we will sow the things that are of the Spirit, we will be able to reap life everlasting. Moses reaped that which was everlasting because of the choice he made not to indulge in sin, but to indulge in affliction. By the way, you and I today, we don't understand what affliction is. We have no concept of what it is to be afflicted. Someone says that's a very brave statement. But it's a very true statement. I'll say that. <coughs> I know of a female. I'm not going to name her. She's not here. I won't name her because she might be your first cousin. Many of you like to go camping. Some of you go in a camper. Some of you still camp old style, maybe in a tent. This young lady's <coughs> idea of roughing it is staying in a five-star hotel without a hot tub in the bathroom. Amen. What kind of affliction is she suffering? How many of us, and I say that to say we're soft today. That's what I'm saying. How many of us would have been able to withstand the journey from the land of Egypt to the edge of the waters of the Red Sea and been able to endure the crossing of the Red Sea all the way on dry land how many of us would have been able to do that? I can barely walk from here to the back of the auditorium before I'm out of breath. Why? I'm out of shape. I'm fat. I'm, I'm, I'm out of shape. Now, don't encourage anyone sitting on the front row in green to make me get up at 5.30 in the morning and go to the gym every day. I'm soft. I would have never made, been able to make that journey. I believe the, the Israelites that left the land of Egypt were able to make the journey because they knew that God was a higher power. And they were willing to suffer. Although their afflictions were great and their thoughts to suffer were temporary at times, think about those who entered into the land of Canaan. Was the risk worth the reward? Sin is temporary in pleasure. But thirdly, this morning when I think about sin, I go and I look at the book of John, chapter 8, and look at verse 34. John, in John 8, and verse 34, the words of Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Sin <coughs> enslaves us. Paul also makes the same point over in Romans chapter 6 and in verse 16 where he says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave? If you choose to be the slave of sin, death is your reward. He goes on and says, If you choose to be a slave of obedience, righteousness can be your reward. This gives me a good opportunity. I know some of you won't be back tonight. But I want to encourage all of you to come back because we're going to pierce it here tonight. Our sermon is entitled, Pierce My Ear. Someone says, what kind of topic is that? It's a song. It's a song that everyone should sing, not just our young people. 
We'll talk about it tonight. But brethren, understand something. To whom you yield yourself a servant of, that's who you're going to serve. When you allow yourself to become enslaved by sin, it just overtakes our life. And understand how it works. Sin starts out as what we define today as human beings. Because this doesn't go along with what Brother Les read for us about the definition of sin, that it is the transgression of the law. That one who commits lawlessness is committing sin. Understand that we justify in our mind the first sin. It's only one it's only one little thing that we do in our life. And so we start with those quote, so-called little sins. And before you know it, guess what? We begin justifying the little sins and we start doing and sinning quote-unquote greater sins. I don't believe the Bible defines sin as a little sin or a great sin. I believe the Bible defines sin as that which one sin is going to keep me out of heaven and eternity forever. The one sin that I will not repent of. If I allow sin to enslave me, if I allow sin to overtake my life, what is going to happen? Someone wrote these words at one time. They said one reason sin flourishes in our lives is that it is treated like a cream puff rather than a rattlesnake. Would you handle those two differently? Boy, I could eat, a, I, I could eat probably a, a, a hundred cream puffs right now. That's how hungry I am. But don't anybody bring a rattlesnake because I'm going to make a door going right this way. <laughs> Promise you. Mm -hmm. Maybe we ought to look at sin as the rattlesnake instead of a cream puff because in a cream puff we'll indulge, but when we see a rattlesnake we run away. That's what we ought to do to sin. We ought to run the other direction away from it so that we won't allow it to enslave us and entrap us into a lifestyle that we don't want to live. You see, the reason that people become engulfed in error and in sin is because they never have the ability to pull themselves out. If I'm sinking in the pit of sin and I'm struggling, I need you. I need you. We as Christians need each other as we go through the turbulence of this earthly life. There is not one of us here this morning in this assembly who does not fall prey to the temptation of sin. We all see sin. We all see the appeal of sin. And we all fall prey. I need encouraged. You need encouraged. We can help each other get out of the enslavement of sin if we're willing to let someone help us. You see, I understand that when one becomes a slave to sin, it's difficult. It's not easy to overcome. But thanks be to God that through His Son, Jesus Christ, we have a sacrifice given that will take away our sin as long as we are willing to submit our lives to His will. But lastly, when I think about sin, I hope that this is your attitude towards sin. That sin is a disgrace. Sin should disgrace us. Sin should embarrass us to the point that we are going to want to do what is right. Notice what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 19. Actually, we need to start in verse 18. <laughs> Philippians 3, verse 18 says, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, 
that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is their destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. Talk about the enemies of the cross of Christ. That are those, that is, he is referring to those who glory in their sin instead of allowing that sin to disgrace them, embarrass them, to repentance, to come back to righteousness. Jeremiah had a great deal to say about that. If you go back to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 6. Notice what Jeremiah records for us there in Jeremiah 6, beginning in verse... Uh, we'll, we'll just read verse 15. That's the only verse we really need to read. Jeremiah says there, Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? He asked a question. Were God's people ashamed when they committed abomination, sin? No. They were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall at the time I punish them. They shall be cast down, says the Lord. When you and I are not willing to be ashamed of our sin, the fall is coming. The fall is coming. And the fall is going to be great. When I think about shameful disgrace, instead of finding glory in our sins, James says that we need to mourn and we need to weep about our sins. When's the last time you cried openly about sin that's in your life? When's the last time that you were like Jesus? You remember at the end of Jesus' life as he went and he looked and peered into the city. What happened to Jesus? He wept over the city. Why? Because of the sin that was there. When's the last time we wept about sin in our society? I believe Jesus speaks about that. And this is extra this morning. I'm not going to charge you any extra. But when I go back to the Sermon on the Mount and I look at the Beatitudes, when I begin to read there in verse 4 where it says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That is not referring to one who is in mourning over the loss of a loved one. Jesus is saying to be blessed mourning over a lost soul. When's the last time we wept openly because souls were being lost? Sin has disgraced us that we have no feelings to weep openly. Our attitude must be the attitude of the Apostle Paul. When you look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 and you look at verse 15, Notice what Paul calls himself. Paul says, I am the chief of sinners. Paul says, I am the world's worst. I'm number one when it comes to sinners. <laughs> Brethren, I know sin disgraces me. I know that I fall short of God, what God wants me to be. I fall short of that every day. But I thank again. For the blood of Jesus Christ who makes me whole. You see, you and I, we need to have the attitude of David. I turn back and I look at the 51st Psalm and notice the humility in the words of David. In verse 1, he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. I'm glad God has mercy on us today. And then he says, Blot out my transgressions. God, will you forgive me for what I've done? He says, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I, look what he says, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin 
is ever <laughs> Why did David say that his hand <coughs> was never before him? It was so that he would not shame the name of God ever again. David wanted to remember the sin that he committed that led to the writing of Psalm 51, and that was the adulterous relationship that he had with Bathsheba. He wanted to remember that what he did was an abomination in God's sight. He wanted to remember it so he would never do it again. And that's why he comes on down in verse 10, and he can say to the Lord our God of heaven, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and take not my take not your Holy Spirit from me. Brethren, sin is evil. Sin will destroy us. One man wrote it this way. Man calls it an accident. God calls it an abomination. Man calls it a blunder. God calls it blindness. Man calls it, a, calls it a defect. God calls it a disease. Man calls it chance. God calls it choice. Man calls it error. God calls it enmity. Man calls it fascination. God calls it fatality. Man calls it an infirmity. God calls it an iniquity. Man calls it a luxury. God calls it a leprosy. Man calls it liberty. God calls it lawlessness. Man calls it a trifle. God calls it a tragedy. Man calls it a mistake. God calls it madness. And then lastly, man calls it weakness. Calls it weakness. God calls it willfulness. <laughs> Brother Brian, what have you allowed sin to do in your life? <clears throat> now, over the next several weeks, on Sunday morning, I'm going to look at some specific things that are affecting the church and our world. Next week, we're going to begin a two part lesson, I do believe it is, on marriage and the Master's teaching. I believe that the downfall of the family and of the home is what's leading to the downfall of the church. And because it's a downfall within the church, it is becoming a downfall in society. Let's not get that backwards. It starts in the church before it goes to society. I hope all of you will look at your life. And I hope all of you will do as David did. Examine your life and see that sin is going to take you a lot further than you want to go. Because sin that is unrepented of, sin that is unforgiven, will lead you down the wide and the broad path that leads to destruction. That leads to an eternity in hell, separated from the God of heaven. This morning we may have one who needs to change their life. Maybe we have one this morning who needs to come with an obedient heart to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hearing the word, believing that word, <laughs> determining that sin is not the life you want to live. When you confess and repent, change the way you live, confess the name of Jesus as the Son of the living God, be immersed in the watery grave of baptism, and contact his blood so you sin can be washed away. Do we have someone this morning that needs to do that? Sin will destroy you if you allow it to and do not obey the gospel of Christ. Or do we have one this morning who's a member of the body, but you turned your back and you've fallen back into the way of sin and it has become your master once again and you want to get out of that. You need to come repenting and confessing those sins. That's why your brethren are here. We want to help you. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. We want to do whatever we can do to ensure that we all get from this side of eternity, cross the gulf, and live in eternity with God forever. This morning, what is your need? Only 
you know only you can make the response that you need to make. We pray that you will come to the front and make your needs known while together we stand and while we stand.